Well, good evening, folks. Um, I'm David Politzer. I'm the director of the School of Art at the University of Houston. And I wanna welcome everyone to the third event in our fall speaker series, a lecture and conversation with artist Nicholas Gallinan. I'm super excited for this series this year. We've lined up a stellar group of visitors. Uh, last month, we spoke with writer critic Aruna D'Souza and design activist Dean Nichols. Next week, we hear from uh, Derek Adams on October 22nd at seven o'clock. I invite you to check the events page on the School of Art website for more information. Um, that's where you'll find all the links you need to connect to, to that talk and then to our spring series of talks, which we'll have uh, beginning next semester. Speaking of dates, uh, have you made your voting plan yet? As you may know, early voting has begun, so you can cast your ballots as early as today if you wanted to. The best advice to ensure your vote is counted and your voice is heard is to pick a date and bring a buddy. That's our campaign in the College of the Arts. And by that, I mean find a friend and set a date and time on both of your calendars together. And that way you'll help one another, one another remember and motivate one another to, to get it done. There's even a polling place right on campus, uh, Student Center South, room 220, so you can early vote uh, at UH. And if you haven't heard yet, uh, yesterday, our mayor, Sylvester Turner, put out a challenge uh, between UH, Rice, and TSU to see who could rack up the most early votes. So um, we want to win that. Uh, I'll post another document in the, uh, in the chat with some helpful tips on how to vote safely. Just a couple notes about how tonight is gonna to run. Um, first, we're recording the talk and it will be available later on our YouTube channel. And speaking of that YouTube channel, it's quickly becoming a rich archive of our past lectures in this series. In addition to the concurrent series happening, interrogating the global contemporary, which is being organized by the School of Art Art Historians. Uh, next, this is a webinar, so you may have noticed some differences to regular Zoom meetings that you've attended. You don't have all the same buttons down here that you normally have. Um, really, all you can do is raise your hand and use the chat and Q&A boxes. But we would love you to do both of those, all three of those things enthusiastically during the talk. And uh, as a practice to get everybody started, why don't you go ahead and tell us where you're from, where, where you're beaming in from. Go ahead and type that in the chat right now, if you would. Uh, when we begin the Q&A, if you'd like to ask a question live, just use the raise hand button and we will unmute your mic so you can ask your question, you can speak that question. And we're also gonna monitor the Q&A. So uh, we're happy to ask, uh, speak your questions for you if you wanna type it, if you prefer to do it that way. The only caveat that I'll mention is that if you're using an older version of Zoom, you may not be able to raise your hand or join with your voice. If that's the case, just use the Q&A box and we will speak your question for you. Uh, before I turn it over, I wanna introduce Eric Zambrano, who is with us this evening. He is a School of Art MFA alumni. Eric earned his sculpture degree in 2020 and is now teaching for us in the School of Art. He will be co-moderating with Anna Mayer who is assistant professor of sculpture in the School of Art. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Oh, you gotta unmute, Anna. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, and thanks, Eric, for being here. It's nice to have you with us in this capacity. Um, earlier this year, I started looking in depth at Nicholas Galanin's work as I researched for a seminar that I'm teaching this semester on the topic of dirt. Um, after doing my research, I quickly realized that Nicholas's work is not only extremely relevant to multiple other classes that I'm teaching, um, but that his practice is meaningful for the entire School of Art here at the university, as well as for the larger community of artists in the city of Houston. 
So I'm really glad he's here with us today. Nicholas Glannon is a Clinkett and Unangax multidisciplinary artist. His work engages contemporary culture from his perspective rooted in connection to land. He embeds incisive observation into his work, investigating intersections of culture and concept in form, image, and sound. Glannon's work embody critical thought as vessels of knowledge, culture, and technology. It's inherently political, generous, unflinching, and poetic. Galanin engages past, present, and future to expose intentionally obscured collective memory and barriers to the acquisition of knowledge. His works critique commodification of culture while contributing to the continuum of Clinkett art. Galanin employs materials and processes that expand dialogue on indigenous artistic production and how culture can be carried. His work is in numerous public and private collections and is exhibited worldwide. Glannon, apprentice with master carvers, earned his BFA at London Guildhall University and his MFA at Massey University in New Zealand. He's the recipient of the 2020 Soros Fellowship, which is awarded to 10 artists, curators, cultural organizers, and researchers working at the intersection of migration, public space, and the arts. His contribution to the most recent Sydney Biennial was widely celebrated and it's the piece has informed current conversations about public monuments. He lives and works with his family in Sitka, Alaska. Thanks so much for being here, Nicholas. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good to see all the comments on where everybody's tuned in from. Um, appreciate it. The opportunity to share with you, Yehiatsin, Yuhat Duasak, Luknahari Hatsati, Kagwantan Yadi Ayahat, Shid Kakwan. My name is Yehiatsin, Nicholas Galanin. I am Luknahari, a child of the Kagwantan people of Sitka. Um, this is home. This image here, I always like to start with um, photos of of the land and um, <clears throat> it's such a important aspect of who we are. Uh, the land shapes us and our cultures if we listen. Um, for me being home on uh, this indigenous land is also a form of resistance in a nation that was built uh, through removal of indigenous peoples and bodies uh, from land for settler occupation, uh, remaining in my home is really important part of connection. Um, we still uh, come from a place of abundance and sustenance um, and the care for place comes from understanding of um, the seasons and how we survive, how we uh, provide for our family, um, fishing, we follow seasons. We, ha we have, uh, you know, the real calendar isn't on the wall. It's, it's uh, with the environment and um, that's such an important part of uh, being here and, and teaching love and survival to our children. Uh, this is smoking salmon. It's a seasonal thing that we've done, we've done for, um, as I was growing up, it's my father and the smokehouse. Um, understanding where things come from understanding our connection, understanding process um, is so important in a world that's continually further and further disconnected. Disconnected even though the uh, internet and technology connects us in different ways. We're disconnected from place oftentimes. Um, teaching my children where these things come from and how to process and care for them. Um, 
This is my great grandfather, uh, George Benson in the center here. Uh, I wanna speak a little bit about continuum, continuum and um, lineage of, in my family through cultural art. This is such a large foundation to the work I do in my voice and um, to my understanding of everything else this is where I've really begun my training. Um, as a cultural artist, my great grandfather was a wood carver, and this is a model canoe of a customary Clinket or Northern style dugout canoe that was created for the community here in Sitka. Um, my father, David Galanin Kinda, who's a my mentor still, um, also an, a jeweler, sculptor, and musician. Um, my father. Uh, my uncle, Will Burkhart, uh, also a mentor, um, wood carver, jeweler, and my children who are also in this continuum. Um, they're around the studio all the time. They're not only seeing the cultural work that's being produced, they're helping with it when they can, and then they're also you know, in dialogue with all these other ideas and projects that I'll share with you. Um, a lot of my work involves um, bringing voice to oftentimes a community that's actively purposefully ignored or um, just unrecognized generally. Engagement. This is a project in my studio right now that I'm working on. That was that house post that I was showing, showing you. And I've, I've, my cousin is apprenticing on this project. So um, process isn't just a, about creating the object. It's about passing on knowledge as well, oftentimes. And it's about those further engagements. Process is also about engagement with community. Um, my cousin Lee, I showed you as a photo of his father, my uncle Will that was carving Lee's now doing this work uh, and been working alongside me for a few years. Uh, <clears throat> this is a 40 foot totem um, as a lead carver on and I had five apprentices, including Lee, who carved this in 2018. The totem pole or kutia is the clinket word for totem pole was carved for um, Takukwan uh, a village site in Douglas, in Juneau, Alaska, Douglas Island. Um, in the 60s, the Clinket village was intentionally burnt down to remove, um, remove homes and families to make way for a boat harbor. This uh, pole was created um, as a project with Gold Belt Heritage and the community as a healing pole to, um, you know, mark the site as a Clinket village. Uh, it's still the site of the Clinket village. And then also to um, heal from some of that uh, process of, of colonial violence that's still ongoing in our communities. Colonization sometimes is discussed as something of the past it is still ongoing today. Uh, it's still happening on a lot of these unceded uh, indigenous territories that are settled by settler occupation still today. Um, the healing of this project to me was uh, through working with community, working with elders, cultural protocol. Uh, the work was carved at a elementary school so that, you know, the, the children witnessed the process. Um, and the transfer of knowledge and training apprentices to create, uh, in this continuum and in this practice was also definitely a part of that healing. We uh, come from a community of 
with 15,000 plus years of connection to place here. And this language is vital to that ancient visual language that's still being developed and still expanding. So um, this is some jewelry work. Uh, also a part of my practice was uh, doing, studying other forms, including wood carving and jewelry. And I wanted to expand on um, my understanding of material and process uh, after several apprenticeships here in my community. I went on to study at London Guildhall University in England for jewelry design and silversmithing. And while I was in London, I uh, tried to incorporate what I was familiar with from the was the, the visual language and cultural art that I had been studying um, into curriculum and was told that I could not bring that to the um, space to, to work. They said it was too literal. Uh, of course, as a student, I didn't really know how to process that and um, kind of set aside all of that cultural identity and uh, work while I was studying there. Um, I didn't set it aside for myself. I set, I just didn't share it with my mentors and my teachers. Um, oftentimes we're um, told to, that we can, you know, progress our knowledge and further our understandings of things through institution and for, um, and uh, college education, et cetera. But we're many times asked to hang up our identity at the door in those spaces. Um, and that's still that's still common today in uh, um, these institutions. It's still an issue. It's still an issue represented in what is um, what is uh, allowed to even even if you look at the statistics of who's hired and holding staff in in these institutions. Oftentimes, our communities are severely underrepresented. Um, I kept my ideas and um, body of work separate. I never brought them in. I finished that program and I continued on um, to, to work on my master's degree at Massey University in um, uh, New Zealand, Aotearoa and in indigenous visual arts. And a lot of expansion of my ideas and visual work really started the shift in that space. I felt supported, and I felt safe. And um, I still think it's rare to find programs like that even now. Uh, it's an, this is an image um, from recent protests in Seattle. Um, not only in Seattle, but you know, these, these uh, protests has, storming the globe really um anti-police brutality black lives matter um i want to share this image because this is rick Wil rick williams in the photograph um rick williams is the brother of john t williams uh, john t williams was, was a wood carver in Seattle that was crossing the street with his totem pole and wood carving knife when officer Ian Burke um, shot him in the back four times, murdering him in the street uh, on August 30th, 2010. The uh, 10 years later, these conversations still continuing. This is really an extension of, you know, historical civil rights movements. Um, it's never really ended. Uh, <clears throat> this work is titled, My Ears Are Numb. It's a hand drum from a flag. Uh, and then the drumstick carved out of red cedar. Um, referencing that violence, referencing that statistically Native Americans are at the highest risk of being killed by police officers. Uh, the precedent for this behavior has been well established throughout the history of the United States in which military Calvary and settlers were legally protected and often rewarded for murdering indigenous men, women, and children. An extension of that settler violence. 
uh, is continued today. God complex, ceramic right gear reflects the fragility and fear of the police state. The position references an attempt at making martyrs out of those who damage our communities and murder black and brown youth by politicians and media. The title refers to the pathological belief that police exist above the rest of us with the authority to determine who lives and how. This is a legacy of historic colonial violence on indigenous land. Uh, the shadow on the land and excavation and bush burial. This is work commissioned for the Biennale of Sydney near in 2020. Um, I had been brought out and invited to create a piece for the Biennale um, over a year ago. It was my first visit. So I flew to Australia and met with the um, local community. I had the really the privilege of flying up to the Tiwi Islands um, and meeting with Aboriginal artists and community. Um, I think visiting place and trying to gain understanding of uh, communities is really important to my practice. Um, and just important to, to really understand and connect with, you know, the, the histories. We have so many shared histories with um, other indigenous communities around the globe with the violence of colonization, the displacement of colonization, the um, those continual um, battles that we fight for sovereignty, for human rights, basic human rights. Um, in that conversation, there's so many different um, entry points of uh, institutionalizing or homogenizing knowledge or narrative. Um, one narrative that I really wanted to work with while I was out there was the, the history of monuments and um, heroes, um, the history of statues and discovery narratives, you know, this was, with Australia, they're coming up, up with a are coming into the 250th anniversary of Cook's arrival, um, and the erasure that happens in this white supremacist narrative of discovery. Um, in order to claim discovery, like the statue at Hyde Park, you have to um, not you have you have to actively and purposefully disregard. Uh, uh, the community that's been in that place for tens of thousands of years. Um, the Cook statue in Hyde Park has it, that discovery um, narrative that it ho holds and uh, the fight for visibility in our communities is tied to so many other things, to human rights, to land rights, to subsistence rights, to um, environmental uh, issues. So I proposed to do work and originally I was hoping to excavate the shadow of the Cook statue directly in, in the park. Of course, the city wouldn't approve that. And um, I think that this worked out better, to be honest. Um, distilled down to this work that allows for uh, critical conversations in history land and um, even in monuments without physically having the statue present is important a lot of a lot of the real basic arguments or dialogues in this would be well if you take that down we lose our history and that's completely false um, excavating the shadow uh, is a proposed future burial for the statue uh, was the, a part of the concept in the work. So the process of digging deep enough to bury the, the statue, U utilizing um, archaeology 
as process, recognizing that archaeology is oftentimes a scientific process that continually upholds white supremacist narratives, placing romanticized ideas and perspectives of indigenous communities in the past, keeping romanticized ideas and perspectives of indigenous communities to the past. Um, another important part of this process was to use that science to, to uh, contradict the, the discovery plaque on the monument, because when you dig down into indigenous communities, grounds and soils, you'll find all aspects of indigenous uh, history and so society. Um, speaking about uh, white supremacy and uh, settler colonization. Um, this was a recent photo of um, the Cook statue in Hyde Park um, during these protests uh, that have been really circling the globe. Um, it's a conversation that we see here in America and the US as well with uh, Confederate monuments or statues, with uh, the recent statue at um, American Museum of Natural History uh, in New York, which also I recall seeing photographs like this where, where protests were calling for the removal of the racist uh, statue to uh, only be met with police presence and barricades protecting said object or monument or statue. Um, oftentimes, it's not even the figure or the, the work that's being upheld in this instance, it's the um, ideology um, where, where our communities are actively or purposefully ignored, um, even bringing into the um, issues and problematic uh, narratives surrounding, say, Columbus. Uh, as you see the White House's statement recently on Columbus is um, problematic on so many levels. Uh, to, to upholding heroes that were violent towards our communities and to upholding heroes that not only were violent, but raped, murdered, pillaged, participated in perpetuating genocide. Um, that is what a lot of these conversations gloss over intentionally. Um, that is, uh, what part of this barrier and this project and this work comes in to recognize that side of the conversation. Um, and then one other aspect that I like to share about this particular piece in the title is, uh, well, shadow on the line and excavation and bush burial and excavation also reference to, uh, particularly in this work, I will, you know, the, it's a, the, pro, the project's a work site, so it's not really a completed process. Um, but the concept to dig down deep enough wasn't allowed in this particular space because the soil is so polluted and <clears throat> this work also highlights, I believe, that, that environmental terrorism and pollution that, and the destruction that happens through um, colonial resource extraction that continues still to this day. We have pebble mine here in, in Alaska that is um, really a critical um, fight in our communities for uh, clean, safe environment versus, you know, the polluting extraction of, of, well, in this case, metals, but that's common across the globe. Um, a bush burial is also an aspect of the title here that I like to share and speak about. The bush burial is a painting in Australia um, that was done in 1890s, it's a landscape painting. I don't have an image here to show you, but it was by Frederick McCubin. Um, and it is a painting of the first white 
man or settler buried on Aboriginal soil in Australia. Um, and it's a fabricated romanticized narrative of settler body embedded into land and the history and conquest. So that, this is also a reference to that burial, but this time we're burying the monument. Architecture of return, escape, metropolitanism of art. This is the first series of high paintings guiding the escape of indigenous remains and objects and non-indigenous institutions to return to their home communities. Architecture of Return Escape Metropolitan Museum of Art is a mapped escape plan for objects held in the Met in New York City. The work is a plan for wayfinding during decolonization, requiring return, building new structures for good ways of being, of the few objects held in display cases, many more, including human remains and ceremonial objects not intended for public view are held in museum archives. The cost and process required to travel and visit these archives limits access to cultural knowledge and inheritance for indigenous communities and continues the removal of the objects from their land and people. While institutions control the air temperature, humidity, UV exposure and dust, they are unable to adequately care for these objects in cultural or spiritual ways. Painting information on hides to remember and instruct has a long history in many indigenous communities, particularly for recording significant events or feats of bravery. In a series of, in a series of work, hide paintings depict a floor plan referencing a visitor guide and architecture blueprints for building. The objects themselves are unwilling visitors to the museum and the painting builds a route for escape and vision for reunification of culture and heritage with community. In the painting, the galleries of the museum containing indigenous American objects along with elevators and stairs coming from the archives are marked with red dashed lines leading to the exit. The exit from the museum is also an entrance for cultural at U ceremonial objects imprisoned in these spaces, an entrance for return to land, community, and culture. The work serves as a reminder of the past and as a plan for a good way forward, where stolen objects, human remains, and work sold under duress can return home from their, for their own health, for the health of communities that created them, for the health of communities that took them. At U, inside a closed container, at U inside a closed container is a weathered bentwood box with form line design attached to the box face. Carved wooden safe handle and a carved wooden combination dial bearing the number one and fractions counting down to zero. Instead, a number is counting up by 10. Inside the box is an unaltered sea otter hide with pattern outlines drawn on the skin. The weathered box represents a container for our culture. Knowledge and customs that they have weathered it through time and continue to be carried forward, transformed into a kind of safe. The work insists on the value of cultural knowledge and practice. The sculpture bears the impulse to protect what's been valuable and threatened through colonial understanding of wealth as something restricted to a few. The combination lock and safe handle are clearly new additions to the weathered box and represent requirement of blood quantum as a barrier to access. The fractions on the combination dial point to the barring of descendants from accessing ancestral knowledge, cultural practices, and rights based on fractions of certified Indian blood. The sea otter hide contained within the box has not been significantly altered in accordance with United States wildlife fish and game legislation. So under US law, the work cannot be owned by an individual not determined legal via native blood quantum. The otter hide bearing pen outlines of uncut children's mitten patterns demonstrates the unfinished labor and blockage of culture continuum forced into indigenous culture by federally legislated blood quantum and arbitrary nature of who and what is considered whole. Legislation around the sale of fraud or like blood quantum re revolves around perceived wholeness. A hide that cannot be made whole again is considered acceptable for non-Alaska native sale and the person not considered a large enough fraction of a whole. Alaska natives cannot continue this cultural practice. The conversation around blood quantum is, is really what this work is. It's um, blood quantum, if you're not familiar with it, is a measurement of 
um, authenticity and identity and cultural connection that is colonial implemented. It's a measurement that only detracts from connection, eventually removing us completely from our ancestral communities, from our lands, from our rights to those lands. And um, one of the federal laws right now is who's allowed to hunt seal or sea otter. Um, if your child is based on blood quantum measurements uh, less than, I believe it's a 16th, maybe eighth or 16th, then they, they can't um, touch the sea otter hide for any kind of work. They can't, can't pass on that knowledge of processing it. They can't hunt the seals, et cetera. Um, it's a direct um, break in what we're allowed to pass on or share through our customs and our cultures. What have we become? This is a series uh, 2000, in this piece, 2000 pages of, from Smithsonian Institute's uh, anthropological series and text published on Clinkett culture in the 70s. It's a uh, looking at the practice of homogenizing cultural knowledge, cultural history, um, and shaping it back, bringing it back to us via, via text. So this, through this process of cutting um, these books into, in this case, my portrait and face, um, some of it's about identity perceived identity even. Uh, a lot of those historical and cultural texts um, romanticize and prioritize uh, this idea of authenticity or purity through pre-colonial contact as, as a form of uh, signifying cultural belonging or identity. Um, through that process of cutting every page by hand before binding it, I found that the um, an artifact of that work was the, almost like a hologram type um, image from each page cut. It's kind of tough to photograph, but if you held that up, this would look almost three-dimensional. Um, and then the other side of the page of that is in kind of inverted form of that face. What have we become gold? Part of the process of doing this work was to free uh, myself at the time from, um, there, there's so many preconceived stereotypical ideas of what uh, indigenous art is or isn't. Um, coming from a culture that has a very powerful, strong, iconic, abstract, unique visual language um, and I've referenced that to the totemic forms, the totem poles, the, the monuments that we created in our communities um, and the materials and the technologies we've worked with. Those things often are heavily romanticized in our voices today and our experiences. I wanted to create a work free from that that still carried our experiences into, you know, a, a, a larger context. Um, this work is free from any of that language, but it still directly references the homogenization of our knowledge and our language and our um, and that process of oftentimes having to have our culture fed back to us through this institutional text. The total bowl on the northwestern coast, in coast Indians was a sign word. Both animal and human figures, the pool was a substitute for the printed word. Something. These are some video works. Um, let's talk about who we are. Who we are is anthropological catalogs of removal, foundations to institution. The disposition lays groundwork for appropriation. 
Um, this is a 15 minute video loop in the work, the images is, I believe over 35,000, could be wrong, somewhere around there, 35,000 individual frames of cultural objects uh, in these objects stolen from our communities, placed into institutions around the world. Um, not only placed in institutions, but placed in this new anthropological context. Um, these objects, ceremonial objects, oftentimes from my community are known as at u, which would mean they belong to your grandchildren's children. They're not things that you would personally own. This goes on for some time. Indians children's bracelets. Tourists and collectors overlook our history while consuming iconography. To see only metal and design and jewelry in this ignores other historical information, selective amnesia. These bracelets don't allow for our history to be ignored, honoring the resilience of survivors and generations affected by the weight of wearing them. Three separate sets of these re, uh, were created and they're all to remain in separate institutions. It's uh, a conversation about the violence towards our children, the removal of our children through boarding schools, through um, breaking up of our families and, that, and, and the desire to consume aspects of us still through our visual language, through our, through our work while completely ignoring or neglecting the other realities of our communities and the other histories that we um, share. Accessorize yourself with these timeless beauties, hand carved native rape whistle earrings featuring a traditional clinket lovebird design. Rape and pillage of the land and bodies of this land has been ongoing since 1492. Violence against native women has been allowed by the refusal to tribal courts to try non-native individuals. How are we doing for time? Um, you could go for five more minutes. How does okay. that sound? Do you want more time? Five or ten. No, we can do five. We can do five more minutes. I just have there's so many things. I'll keep skipping ahead here. Um, okay. Inert the inability to progress or move forward. Uh, this work, the wolf, like indigenous people, has been damaged by colonization of this land and continues to move despite efforts to change the living and to trophies. So the back half of this wolf, for me, represents the attempt to contain the living, the attempt to contain, um, and, and that containment in relationship to indigenous culture and communities has happened in so many different forms from containing our knowledge through homogenization to containing our literal objects in institutions and museums and our land even through borders and barriers. Uh, the front half of this work represents our living sovereignty, um, obviously settler colonialism does not want the wolf that can bite it back. And we are through our resilience are still free to move and, and um, live as we see fit. So. Suhedi to Shugak Titan. I'm going to just go through these quickly. This is a two part video piece. Title references um, a 
trans the title translates uh, to we will again open this container of wisdom that's been left in our care. It's a celebration of culture and the necessity of contribution over consumption. Song and dance and language is intersecting streams to carry cultural continuum. The American dream is a lie and well, the foundation of a dream built on genocide, theft, slavery, deceit, and erroneous and supremacy. The dream cuts cultures with lies in the form of constructed borders, xenophobia, white supremacy, and nationalism. This work speaks to the continued violence celebrated through trophy and American excess, gold teeth and bullet claws, reminders of the quest for wealth that drove colonization and manifest destiny and the continued use of military aggression by the United States throughout the world. Operation Geronimo. I think it goes like this, reflects decimation of indigenous knowledge and technology by colonization, aggressive mining of land and culture to create capital denied sovereignty of indigenous cultures. We have fracturing communities and knowledge and continue to create. The title recognizes our efforts to arrange the fractured pieces and to work with what we have, continuation and sovereign resilience. White Carver. White Carver's story is simple. He visited the Pacific Northwest on a cruise ship in the 1960s where he fell in love with Clinkett art. Upon his return home, he purchased several books on Clinkett culture, studied ceremonial objects and forms closely. Eventually, White Carver took some classes and purchased some knives. Today, White Carver demonstrates, sells, and creates native art in this performance installation. White Carver is attempting to create a yellow cedar sculpture of a male masturbation tool that I carved myself with my indigenous hands, titled I Love Your Culture, Fine Woodworking. Portraits of the past White Carver's hanging in his studio, acknowledging his legacy. And taking on the role of White Carver, the White Carver has no other identification or name. He is only known for his role as a White Carver. I Love Your Culture, Fine Woodworking, named after the incessant claims of non-native cultural consumers to whom the work is directed as a fetish object. It immortalizes targeted desire of a single part of an otherwise ignored whole. Illustrates the failure of culture to learn from, love and respect women and indigenous culture. The lack of knowledge, knowledge or appreciation of land, women and indigenous culture is systematic of larger disease of settler society. The story of us on the receiving end of the violence and the Mon and the monuments to our warriors. Ruminations, relationships to culture through glass, both lens and display case. Ha Ani translates to our land, the celebration of subsistence and the ways we continue to live with and because of what the land provides Indigenous resistance to environmental destruction is not terrorism. We dreamt deaf. So caught up in our own desires and dreams, we have been deaf to our effect on the land and our relatives. These ceramic porcelain tools represent oftentimes the, the tools that were given uh, through colonial government to fight for our rights. And they're, generally won't do what they're intended to do. They'll shatter upon falling. We dreamt death, so caught up in our own desires and dreams. We have been deaf to our effect on the land and our relatives. Taxidermy polar bear shot in the 70s in Shishmaroff by a white sport hunter. The village is now being swallowed by a rising sea. The bear melts into trophy form. We dreamt death is half animal, half rug fixed in the struggle to survive in an unsustainable condition. With his title, we are all implicated in participating in the anthropocentric industrial dream that renders us deaf to our impact on all of our relatives, human and non-human. Speaking to colonizers and colonized, to generations past and future, to humans and animals, as an animal forgetful of our place in the world, the work speaks of losing sight and sound of what is done to us and by us and how we are living. 
what is being lost through our taking. The polar bear is an iconic symbol of the struggle for survival of animals and cultures who have been decimated through colonial corporate enterprises focused on extraction from land, the development of capital without care or consequence. Okay, I think we should maybe make some time for questions. Sounds good. Thank you, Nicholas. Mm -hmm. Um, do you want to keep your screen up or, or? Um, I can take it down. Let me see. Let me get over here real quick. Try to stop share. Sorry. My mouse isn't showing up. There we go. Um. Okay. Did that stop? We're good? Yeah. Yep, we're good. Um, maybe while we're sorting out, we've got a few in a queue. So maybe while we're sorting out, if anybody wants to ask their question um, uh, themselves, there's a kind of quick one to start off with, which is from Suhad Rafi. And they're asking, what made you choose those particular schools? Hey, Suhad. Um, you know, I've, I, I chose L London Guildhall. Um, I think I was like 19 or 20 at the time and I never really traveled um, overseas. Um, I didn't, I was adamant about furthering my uh, practice in jewelry design and silversmithing as a, you know, something I really wanted to do. And so I researched a lot of different programs and there are very few, um, believe it or not, for that type of degree. Um, I also didn't really care to be in the U.S. Um, I didn't feel like I wanted to go through uh, U.S. university culture even. Um, I felt like it was a good time to expand and explore and that's where I ended up being. Um, I lived in London for three years and um, that was such a huge leap for me coming from Alaska. I live in a community of 8,000 people on an island. So when I got off of the train in London with too many bags and like jet lag and a no money in my wallet except for a check from the U.S. that I naively didn't know I couldn't cash over there. <laughs> it was it was quite a uh, experience. And then, uh, of course, the sc school in Aotearoa in New Zealand. My father was living in New Zealand at the time, doing a lot of work closely with the Maori artists and community. And there's such a vital positive exchange happening that I got to see. I went to visit him once and I was just kind of uh, enamored by it all and um, found the program and there was nothing like it at the time. There was nothing like it for indigenous students. There's still very small uh, like programs around the U.S. for our indigenous communities. Um, there's IAIA, there's Evergreen, there's a few other schools and programs that are really starting to shift and shape and uh, be more welcoming to our thinkers and our students and our artists, but it's not really common. And it's, it's a really, it seems like a really uphill battle to enter those spaces and, and to make them welcoming places for our communities. Thank you. Um, I guess I can add, I'll ask a question on that note too, um, and speaking about arts, um, education institutions and, and as um, indigenous people and people of color, students of color, especially speaking about Houston and University of Houston being so diverse and this issue of representation in faculty and, and all these things that you kind of touched on or um, how that's limiting to the work and also the growth in some ways of the students being personal mentally and also like what ideas you're able to explore. But um, I guess 
my question is, um, yeah, like what, what do you see that now, I guess, like that, that, that specific issue of representation in arts education institutions and also galleries, museums, and also what their role is, what the role of both institutions, maybe, um, maybe faculty, students, or what, what, what is there to do aside maybe from the work that we do or maybe in conjunction to it? What do I see it now? Yeah, what do I see it or what? I mean, it's changing, but it's not changing fast enough. There's, there's this major resistance and that resistance often is not because of uh, whether known or unknown, like reasons of maximizing, um, maximizing, you know, white supremacy, even in those, those, those things and, and maximizing that happens in a lot of ways. It happens in not returning objects that are knowingly stolen from our communities um, through bureaucratic detail. It happens through not, um, not returning land. It happens, and, but while, continuing land acknowledgements as practice of like forms of lip service to um, to these things. So yes, it is changing, but it's not enough and it's not happening fast enough. It's slow. There's generations of, of um, artists and they've given their careers and lives towards, you know, these conversations and very little has changed throughout their their time period. Some of them aren't with us anymore. Dr. Uh, James Luna, who's an amazing uh, friend and artist, um, you know, his work was integral at the time and, and it still, we're still sitting on artist panels that have similar conversations that were 20 years ago. So, and the real measurement for some of this change will come through, you know, the statistics of it. Let's look at the actual statistics of how many staff are who's getting like how much uh, who's getting paid what you know those those things are also like uh, are who's represented in these museums and these collections we're severely underrepresented in certain museums and then there's other museums that are built on our bones you know so uh, Um, I guess also to that to that point and answering a question from um, Angela um, Huang, um, you seem to be you sound very resistant to these things and 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 you're very outspoken and you're working very much about that. Um, what resistance have you dealt with in return from galleries or art institutions to to the type of work that you do and how outspoken you are about it? Um, what resistance? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, there's probably a resistance that I never will actively know or see, and that resistance comes in like just not being inclusive to the work or the conversation. I think that's like the first uh, like form of it, and that include that exclusion. So it might be resistance that doesn't even like. I might not personally get the like verbal no, but you know, we might never enter into those spaces. We're not, we're not, we're not in those spaces is the reality of it. The reason that Sydney Biennial was so significant in 2020 was because of, well, Brooke Andrews and his team's work towards curating and inviting communities that are continually underrepresented in, in these institutions that have been running 70 plus years. The Whitney Biennial in 2018, the reason why that was some form of groundbreaking was because those statistics were being um, challenged through representation of who's being represented in those spaces. They still have severely like lacking indigenous artists in their collections. Um, the Venice Biennial and um, Samin Lay being the first uh, black woman to show and represent America, US, which was just announced yesterday is extremely significant, but this is 2020. 
Like, like, what's the holdup? I'm a little bit glitched, so I'm not able to write to, we have lots of questions in the queue. I'm not able to write to them to see if they want to speak their question. But uh, Eric, if you could maybe reach out to a couple of people that way. But I, I did want to ask something about the um, Whitney Biennial. So you were one of the, uh, you were one of a group of artists who once the Biennial had opened, um, uh, indicated that they would pull their work um, in protest of the Whitney's board member who produces tear gas that's been used um, again in warfare and against protesters worldwide. Um, and and that pro that protester, the promise of that protest was effective. He resigned, and it, that was something that had long been called for by um, by artists. Um, Anyway, I wondered if you could talk about that aspect of, of your work, what that looks like, the organizing with other artists. So like we, you know, you've showed images of you working in the studio and you working collaboratively and that's something that maybe is a little bit easier to imagine, but I, I wondered if you could just take us through how that worked, organizing with other artists in that way I mean to hold the museum accountable. That's that was definitely a very specific um, uh, protest that took place. Um, I know it still remains relevant, I believe, when you watch the state of, you know, other human rights, civil rights, move, civil rights movements happening now, still, where that tear gas is and those products are still being used, uh, and that the protests. Um, against police brutality um, we and, and there was other you know the artists were part of that and um, but there was a, a large community also surrounding that in a lot of ways there was there's writers there was workers in the museum there was activists outside of the space so you know it was a it was a big uh, um, organization you know there was organizing organizing that was happening in that and um i think for me it was just to, to show up where you can in that space in that instance it was significant to show up to the to the whitney and to um i felt like i had to show up to participate in even having agency in the conversation later uh and and then and then the the act of removal, the call for removal was obviously when there had become very little dialogue or response from, from the uh, board. So, but yeah, organizing, we, I mean, we, there's so many different ways to communicate now with the internet and all of these things. So um, as you see now in the uh, COVID times or doing surprisingly more and more online and digitally. Uh, but yeah, we, we certainly artists were connected and in conversation during those times um, through any means because there was people all over the world that were in, weighing in on that conversation. So I don't know if I answered that for you, but. Thank you. Um. Here's a question from the Q and A, and yeah, and um, if you would like to um, share a question or or ask it live, uh, please raise your hand. That way we can um, turn on your your mic and you can share a question. Otherwise, we'll read some of them. Um, here's a question from Debbie Vu. Um, what advice do you have for students who are interested in exploring the legacies of colonization and forced assimilation within their work? Um, I mean, there's been a lot of, I, I would there, say, look at what's been, look at the conversations that have been ongoing and had, there's been a lot of, uh, there's a lot of resources and there's a lot of artists, a lot of conversations surrounding this continual, um, process, I believe, um, find out what that is. There's a lot of ways to access that. And then, you know, also 
maybe also look internally like at yourself. I don't know where your position is here and I don't know what that might be in the role of the conversation, but try to understand that. And, 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 you know, that's definitely a great starting point. So. Um, and I think um, Angela is wants to ask a question. So I'm going to um, turn on her mic. Go ahead, Angela. Hi there. Um, my question, I'm curious um, about like within your community um, in Alaska and maybe like what you've seen in other indigenous communities, like um, one is, would you encourage like the youth, like high school or high school age people to like leave their community, travel the world and you did that and it sounded like you kind of had a good experience from it. Um, and I see like a little bit of contradiction because of with that as well, like my concern is that, I don't know, like what if the kids like leave <laughs> permanently? I don't know. And then the other question I was just wondering, you know, um, when your own community saw your artwork, like what was their initial reactions? Um, I'm sure they're really proud of you. Um, but was there any like reactions that were unexpected or anything? Um, I, I, would, I would I would encourage travel for everybody and anyone always. I think we're so uh, there's communities are generally so generous and and we're all so connected in ways that we don't really even know or understand and and I think that there's really it's, healthy exchange to happen in that uh for me i've been traveling for over 10 years just for work even and like heavily and extensively so i'm uh kind of grateful to, for this pause right now because I, this is the longest i've been home uh in over a decade but the process of that travel and those exchanges is is really a, a form of higher education i believe um that you can only get through through that so um there's healthy ways to travel and then there could be you know ways that are not healthy for a community so understanding what that might be um i live in a town that has a tourist economy and a lot of that tourist economy is a big form of you know consumption and consuming and what can i take home with me from alaska and um i think that's a poor version of of what otherwise could be you know meaningful exchanges and and as an artist traveling i have the uh privilege of being invited in into communities and into uh, you know real communities artists and art often has its pulse on the community in ways that other aspects especially tourist facades do not so um yes travel and we don't all have to stay where we are ever you know but what was more important in the conversation is how can we engage and be um in and on land and community in good positive ways that we're not damaging or taking or destroying and, and I think that is what's really important. Um, the other question was, how does my community? Yeah, I was just curious, like how did they react? Did they get like conference, conversation? Sure, there, I don't know, you know, it's, there's, there's definitely, you can, I have, I, I realize coming from my culture community that we come, uh, we're in a time frame where, the, in very recent times, just generations, you know, there's been so much significant change to our culture, and that change, and that loss, or the the taking, or the removal, and the you know forced assimilation, all of these things, um, where even our ceremonies would be, you know, illegal. Um, in that process, communities or people in community might hold really tightly to certain things. And, and I think sometimes that you can suffocate 
culture by holding on to those things too tightly um, as well. So I think it's a balance of, you know, uh, being free and sovereign to move as you need to, because we always will, but also, you know, upholding and understanding historical values that connect us and to place. And um, so, yeah, some people may or may not choose to identify with any of my work is, you know, cultural, but um, it's, yeah, I don't know. I don't really try to get too, too hung up on individual response or reactions all the time. I still do participate in customary cultural work um, that is, is in the um, continuum of protocol and in the continuum of, you know, the visual language and um, I'll always continue that side of things as well, so. Um, I'm gonna just read a question from Jamie Hart, which is, I wonder how you think about the concept of visibility in terms of the art objects. Some things remain visible, some things are non-visible or enclosed. I think about that in terms of manipulating a kind of access to the objects, viewership as connected to a kind of ownership so a denial of that ownership or an attempt to withdraw that ownership. Do you think about that dichotomy in the work? And if so, how? Um, sure, there's, I think it's very specific to projects too. Um, there's, we have, we have cultural objects in our community that aren't meant to be viewed by public. They're, um, you know, objects of power that were used for, by medicine men or women and shamans um, for healing or ceremony. Um, there's um, objects that we create and work that we create for our specific communities. Um, there's works that are created for outside communities. There's work that's created that's meant to hold uh, and continue conversation without without requiring more energy or effort from my, my, our community's part. Um, so, yes, I th think about those things when it's important to the conversation or the, the dialogue. There was a project that I did uh, for a show um, where I had two-way um, mirrors and plinths and inside of those were cultural objects that could view the viewers, but the viewers would not be able to see the work. Oftentimes our work is so heavily um, displayed and viewed and put on in, into, this, into that context that it was a, a different type of exchange. So, Um, there's a question, um, I guess I'm going to put two questions together from two people um, that are kind of related. It's on the, uh, the blood quantum. Um, so Joe asked, um, forgive me for not being knowledgeable. You mentioned that it is a federal crime to process otter skins based on blood quantum. Is there a, um, actual enforcement, enforcement of these laws? And then I guess related to that, Alex um, Dickerson's question, um, do you think blood quantum measurements also applies to the other side of natives? Those, those with small amounts of native blood who don't have access to the same connection, um, who want to be part of their culture, but feel like they can't participate in their culture because of the closeness of it, or I guess maybe the lack of closeness to it, and the possibility of feeling and being perceived as a colonist. Do you see this as an issue as well? So the sea otter question, yes, there's active cases where makers and artisans have been uh, recently like federally tried and um, part of the problematic side of that is the, um, the dialogue and narrative of what defines the term significantly altered, significantly altered 
is the language used. And oftentimes it's up to the federal officer to determine that and these officers are not trained in anything re regarding cultural practice. Um, there was an artist that was making teddy bears out of sea otter and that was deemed apparently not significantly altered or traditional. Um, the issue with that is that the myth of tradition, traditional and the idea of traditional versus contemporary as we are again being frozen in time and in past. Uh, one other aspect of that that is um, worth noting is in um, rules of blood quantum where it's a, a subtractive um, genocide towards our communities and connection to place uh, in contrast to the one drop rule, if you're familiar with that, which is uh, a US um, racist rule of oppression, to uphold oppression where if you have any African American or black ancestry, just one drop, then your those those laws of oppression will, will be um, held towards you. Um, so there's those two contrasting ideas. And and with blood quantum, yes, our even our own indigenous communities have adopted that colonial idea. And it's um, also problematic in a lot of ways. Um, it, it, it just doesn't um, add up the equation of it through time. It's also, um, it's, it denies the reality of our ancestry and our heritage. And, and um, it also assumes that there's some kind of distillation to our culture that will happen through, um, I don't know, other, other, uh, you know, we live in a, we live in a global world where we're traveling and, and working and being with lots of communities all the time. So um, in Aotearoa and New Zealand, I believe the, the Maori community, their uh, model that it is if you have Maori ancestry and Maori community. And I think that the danger of getting how hung up on numbers and, and these other ideas all uh, ignores the reality of what's really being, um, what really needs to be protected and transferred is the knowledge and the care for place and community and, and, those things are uh, more important, I believe, than some of these manufactured or mathematical equations of wholeness. So maybe we'll do a couple more questions. Um, Eric, is there anybody who wants to ask in person? I was wondering if Ashita wanted to. Um, yeah, there, I see Julia and Ashita as well. Um, I think Julia, I had, had her hand up for a while, so I'm, I'm not her first, and then maybe she to afterwards. Go ahead, Julia. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask, um, how do you feel technology has desensitized us to social issues? Um, for example, on Instagram, you see a new post every day, like a new graphic organizer with information every day. Um, and it's kind of, it's just been sensationalized to a point where people can just choose not to care because it's like, oh, I see this every day, it doesn't matter. So how can we decallus ourselves to that and kind of force ourselves to care again? Um, I mean, I can't answer that for everybody for sure or anything, but I think the, the amount of media and uh, the amount of um, information that we have access to um, is immense. Um, there's definitely major um, forms of representation or misrepresentation that carry on into digital landscape um, from the continual uh, onslaught of media posting uh, um, images and videos of say black death um, by by 
police, et cetera, or those forms of violence. Um, and that is an issue to nor if that's normalized in, in anybody's mind that, that those are things that are just seen and experienced and desensitized. Um, the decalicing, I don't know, like connecting and listening and caring to your community and, and humanity, like all those things, that's all uh, part of um, being good humans. So. Um, and I think Ashita had a question, Ashita. So go ahead. Ashita, you're muted. Ah, thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing your work. My question is about process and creation. Uh, if you could share more example uh, where material has been a challenge and where the sacredness of the material to create the art is something that you had to, uh, you know, uh, explore or how can you showcase that? For example, in the totem uh, pole example that you shared, where you brought in children so that they could understand the significance and even the installation uh, process. Um, it could be based on material, music, or, uh, but everything that has spiritual significance. There's, there's definitely cultural protocol in some of these works that engage in that. Um, yeah, the totem was raised and there was community and ceremony for that. Um, the cultural work that's created and used in dance and passed on generationally, that work serves, you know, very um, direct purpose of community engagement. Um, and I think some of that work extends into even other forms of practice and process, uh, whether it's actual community, like cultural protocol that's continued and in, in, in that um, tradition or custom, or whether it's just uh, connecting to your material and process through, you know, I always feel like a lot of this work requires the right mind frame and it requires the, uh, a, a healthy way of approaching it with that mind frame to really succeed at whatever it is that's being created. It's not something that you rush into and try to knock out the meet a deadline and uh, and keep moving like that. It's there's uh, so for me that's a huge part of the prep process, uh, and that's the same with whether it's the monotype prints that I'm making, the jewelry, or the music that I make. Um, so trying to understand that is a big part of it, I think. I don't know if I answered that completely. But. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Ashita. Um, maybe as the last question, um, Jacinta Molina, does Jacinta wanna ask herself, Eric, do you know? Um, she hasn't raised her hand, but if she will, then yeah, we can have her ask okay. it. I also can speak it. Oh, there she is, okay. She wants to call. Go ahead, Nazita. Oh, uh, hello. I, I really love your work. I, I, it catch my attention that you said that while you were in school, you will keep your work for you, but you wouldn't show it to the mentors because it wasn't accepted. I, I would like to know more how do you trust these ideas that you have, even though they were not accepted on the academy? Because when you're young, you just don't know the difference. Yeah, I, I realized it was um, a process that they wanted to uphold in their curriculum and in their definitions of creating and making. And I realized that uh, my community and culture 
was uh, so foreign to them or that space that I think they didn't have the tools to engage with it in any any form or fashion. I, ironically, though, that is also part of an extension of boarding schools historically in our culture and our community where it was these forms of kill the Indian, save the man, forced assimilation, leave your culture and your language and your ceremony out and we will give you our God and we will give you these other ways of living as a, what we deem civilized man. Um, so it became really apparent to me that my instructors there didn't want me to succeed. Um, and I felt like that, but I jumped through the hoops enough to continue on and move on from that. And by the time I was in that other space that where I felt safe and felt like I could really bring these ideas and thoughts to, you know, projects. Um, I had already had a sketchbook full of, full of them. So, yeah. Thanks, Jacinta. Um, I think we should wrap up. Um, thank you so much, Nicholas. Um, I'm really looking forward to um, the conversations that I that I think will be happening on campus now because of um, all of us getting to see your work and, and hear your thoughts about it. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everybody for coming and I will see you next week for the Derek Adams talk. Um, thanks, Eric. Thanks so much, Nicholas. Yeah, thank you.